Welcome to The Ambassador, a prophetic teaching ministry dedicated to reaching the nations and equipping the saints. And now, here's Craig DeMoe with revelation from God's Word. So praise God. Romans chapter 4 is where we're going. Let me pray for you real quick. Praise the Lord. Father, I just thank you for my partner, my friend. I thank you, Lord, for whoever is listening to this broadcast today. Thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Lord God, enlightening the eyes of their understanding, that they may know the hope of their calling and what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints and what you've done for them in Christ Jesus when you not only raised him from the dead, but seated him at your own right hand in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We just thank you that today we are seated with him. And we just thank you that you have put us in that position where there's all authority, all rule over all the systems of the world. And we just want to thank you for it. And Lord, no matter what my friend is facing today, I thank you, Lord, there will be an answer for them as they sit under the word of God. We thank you for it and give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. If you agree with that, say amen. Glory to God. Praise God. That means so be it. Praise God. Now, we're going to look at Romans chapter 4, and this whole chapter talks about Abraham, who is the father of faith. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to read this a little bit slowly because I want to emphasize certain things. I'm going to read it more than once because we want to emphasize what a couple of verses have to say right in the midst of this chapter dealing with our father of faith, Abraham. Praise the Lord. And in, look at verses 13 and 14. Romans 13 and 14 says this. Watch. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which were of the law be heirs, heirs of the world we're talking about, if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made of none effect. Praise God. Now, this scripture is a talking about our father of the faith, Abraham, but there's, it's talking specifically about a promise to Abraham. What is that promise? To be the heir of the world. That word heir is in the Greek, kleronamos, and it's a compound word. It speaks of heritage or inheritance, and it's a word that implies partitioning to a portion or to be parsed, parceled out. It simply means to share, inherit, or possess. Now, in my family, unfortunately, we, we've been through a couple of losses recently. I lost my mother uh, back about four months ago, praise the Lord, at, at the age of 94. And uh, there was an inheritance that came with that. I also recently, more recently, uh, I experienced the loss of a brother, <clears throat> and we are dealing there uh, with his uh, estate. So there's things to be parceled out, to to be shared, to be inherited, to to possess. Praise God! It's part of our inheritance. Praise the Lord! And so you understand what we're talking about here. So what is it that Abram or Abraham? And by extension, you and me are to share, inherit, or possess. It is the world. Listen to me. It's the world, my friend. Praise God. The cosmos in the Greek, is that's the word. It means the orderly arrangement of the world system. Now, the word world is not synonymous with the word earth. I trust you understand that. Neither does the word world refer to the people on the earth. It's so much more. Praise the Lord. The word world has to do with all the systems that govern the affairs of the earth and the people on the earth. 
Now, in the Thayer's Bible Dictionary, there's a lot of definitions given for the word world. And I want to draw out some of these to give you a better understanding of what this scripture is talking about. Because this is saying that Abraham, our father of faith, is the heir or the inheritor, the possessor of the cosmos, the world. Praise God. Thayer says that that world means an apt and harmonious arrangement or constitution, an order, or a government. It also means world affairs, the aggregate of things earthly. It also means the whole circle of earthly goods, endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, and on and on. Praise God. In one of Thayer's writings, he says this about the word cosmos or world. The orderly arrangement of the world. Its goods, its riches, and its advantages. Let me say that again. Its goods, its riches, and its advantages. Now, I hope you're beginning to see what we inherit, praise God, as children of Abraham. See, we're talking about every social system and structure of mankind. We're talking about government. We're talking about commerce and business. We're talking about education, arts, the entertainment, all these things. You know, oftentimes people talk about the seven uh, mountains of influence. And uh, let me give you the list. It's, It's media. It's government. It's education, it's family, it's religion, it's arts and entertainment, it's business and commerce. See, that covers the whole gamut of society and human activity on the earth. Praise God. Now, hold that thought a minute. I want to give you a concept that you may have never thought about much. And I'm going to draw from John 3.16. John 3.16 is the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. Uh, People that are Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, whoever, they know John 3.16. People that are unsaved in the society in which I live here in the United States, they know John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a wonderful scripture. But think about the very first phrase. For God so loved the world. He didn't just say God so loved the people on the planet. He said God so loved the cosmos. It's the same word that's used there in uh, Romans 4.13. Amen. Praise God. God so loved the world. So we're talking about all the systems of the earth, all forms of human activity. We're talking about the seven mountains of influence, all of that. God so loved the world. And you know, when God was creating the, 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 the earth, clear back in Genesis chapter 1, every single day he would, he would create something new. He created the heavens and the earth on the first day. And every single time, he would say, that's good. When he created light, he said, that's good. When he created the the sea creatures, he said, that's good. Every single time, he said, that's good. And it was to be a part of the cosmos. Now, his crowning creation, of course, was mankind. He created Adam in order to rule the cosmos, right? And he gave Adam dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over everything that creeps on the earth, and over everything that God made, God put Adam in charge. So God, but my point is simply this, God did not just judge, or excuse me, God did not just love the people on earth. He loved all of his creation so much that he sent Jesus to redeem it back to himself. Now, of course, in order for God to redeem his entire creation, to uh, to redeem the cosmos, he first of all had to save mankind. And Jesus is the savior of all of mankind. And if people just simply receive the gift of salvation, they're saved. Praise God. But thank God for it. God didn't just save you, though, so that you could have a a personal benefit, 
but he saved you for fellowship, and then he saved you also so you could govern in your rightful place. And that's why it tells us in Romans chapter 4, 13 and 14 that Abram is the inheritor, the possessor of the world. Praise God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not just all the people on the planet. Praise God. Now, God's plan of redemption. See, Adam didn't do with creation what he was supposed to, right? He actually sold out to the enemy. And so mankind and the world had to be redeemed back to God. And so what he did is he came to his covenant man, Abraham, Abram, he was first called. He came to Abram and he cut covenant with Abram. Praise the Lord. And God was not bringing this blessing to Abram or Abraham because of what he did, but because of that covenant. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And uh, so God's plan of redemption included his covenant man, Abraham. God came to Abraham and cut covenant with him so that both he and his seed would inherit all things of the world. God was redeeming everything that Adam and mankind lost in the fall. Praise God. Now, let me just say this. It's impossible to possess the greater if you don't possess the lesser, right? We have to grow up in what God has given us into our inheritance. And what I mean by that is you cannot be in control of the social systems and the structure of the earth if you don't possess your own soul. <laughs> One of my favorite scriptures is Luke 21, verse 19. And there, Jesus is referring to the end times, and he's telling people at the end of the age what to do about themselves. He told them, in your patience, possess ye your souls. Praise God. Take possession of your own soul. Let me just kind of reinterpolate that for you for, you for just a moment. He's saying, in your consistency, your unwavering steadfastness, Take charge of your mind, your emotions, and your will. Take charge of yourself. See, we first have to take charge of ourselves before we take charge of anything else. Right? Praise God. And so we learn to reign in life because we, we go from glory to glory. Praise God. Now, again, you cannot be in control of the social systems and structure of the earth if you don't possess your own soul, if you don't have love, if you don't have joy, if you don't have peace, if you don't have patience and long-suffering and all the other fruit of the Spirit, but also if you don't have health, if you don't have some wealth, praise God, hallelujah, because that gives you some power and authority on the earth. Glory to God. It's not about the wealth and the health. It's really about taking possession the way God wants you to. Listen, some people sometimes hear preaching about walking in the benefits of living a life of faith, and they think it's selfish. It's because they don't understand. Look, we don't rule over our health or rule over our finances or rule over whatever in life just for personal gratification. We do so that God would be pleased in allowing us to be an heir of the world. Praise God. It's for his good pleasure and for the benefit of others. We are training for reigning. Praise God. And that's why, first of all, we learn how to take possession over our own soul, and when we do that, it affects our finances, it affects our family, it affects our health, it affects everything, praise God. God has given us everything that we need in this life, praise God. There's a scripture over in 2 Peter chapter 1 that says that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, praise God, everything. Dealing with our spiritual life and our natural life, God has given us all of it, and he wants us to exercise it. Now, I'm going to read the scripture to you again. Praise God. Romans 3, 13, and verse 14, it says this, For the promise 
that he would be the heir of the world, the cosmos, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, heirs of the world, faith is made void and the promise of none effect. Notice who is going to be the heir of the world. Abraham and his seed, right? Praise God. Well, let me ask the question. Who is the seed of Abraham? Well, we are. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Praise God. Heirs according to the promise. How does it come? Through the righteousness of faith. It's not going to come through the law. It's not going to come through self-improvement and all these kinds of things. Praise God. God takes care of the self-improvement. But first, we must repent, change our mind, and believe the gospel. This is where the church really has been missing it in a lot of ways. You cannot become heir of the world if you're trying to earn it. If you're trying to deserve it. If you're trying to qualify for it. If you do that, you're going to miss it entirely, my friend. See, it's not about you. It's about Jesus and about what he's done for us. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the authority that he's given us. You know, God did give the law, and it was for a reason. It was to show us that we couldn't keep it, right? It was to show us that we were undone, that we were sinners, that we were in need of a Savior, and so he gave us the law, praise God. The law is about your performance. Grace, on the other hand, is Christ's performance. It's not about you, it's about Jesus and what Jesus did for you, praise God. So that's why we trust in him. And we don't just trust in him for our initial salvation or the born-again experience. We trust him for every facet of our life. And I want you to understand that, praise God. We trust him all the time because we are not under the law, we are under grace. That's why I have trouble with people saying things like, well, the Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, and here's how it's going to happen, you know. <laughs> and you just got to do so-and-so. Just sign up for this money-making thing and, you know, that you'll begin to see the wealth of the sinner come your way. You know, there's a little bit of truth in that, but that's really not what the scripture is talking about. Praise God. Uh, you know, no, the, on, the only way we become heirs of the world is through the righteousness of faith. Now, under the old covenant, God says that if you disobey in just one thing, you'll not be blessed, right? Right? James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, he was writing to Jews, and he said in James chapter 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all of it. You know, we're all guilty of breaking God's law. It doesn't matter whether you're a good sinner or bad sinner. It's a sinner. And who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell, right? No, we want, we want to... We want to trust in Jesus, not trust in our own effort. Under the old covenant, praise God. So God says, if you disobey in just one thing, you'll not be blessed. But under the new covenant, if you do one thing right, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to be blessed. And as a matter of fact, you're blessed already. Praise God. Now, God called Abraham... Then he was called Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Just one chapter later, he said that Abram was rich, okay? Genesis 3 verse 2. And I know there's people that say, oh, that's just spiritual riches. But he was more specific than that. He didn't just say he was rich. He said he was rich in cattle and in silver and in gold, material goods and finances, in other words, the means of production and the money itself. Praise God. Hallelujah. He was rich in all of those things. Abraham did not receive from God because he was perfect. He was not perfect. If you just go back and you read in Genesis, you'll find out Abraham was far from perfect. Praise God. We could talk about that for a while. But, but the point is, 
He was blessed because of covenant. And you know, you're blessed because of covenant. You say, well, you know, I haven't done anything to to get into this covenant. Exactly right. You trust in Jesus, praise God. And then you became an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. It's really not your covenant. It's God's, God the Father's covenant with Jesus that you become a part of because you are in Christ. That's how it works. Praise God. Abraham was righteous in God's eyes because of covenant. Now, why are we not seeing more of this blessing in the church? Because we're not seeking God through, through righteousness. We're seeking God through our deeds rather than Jesus' deeds, what Jesus did for us, rather than trusting in the completed work of Christ. Now, this says that this blessing came not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Let me just read that again. For the promise, again, Romans 4.13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Next verse. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made of none effect. Praise God. See, the law will void your faith. Your actions void your faith. Our trust is in Christ. Praise God. So in in being in Christ, we are heirs or or, uh, children of Abraham by faith. It is the devil who tries to condemn us or get us to look at our actions to be blessed. When we feel condemned, it's because we're looking at what we do. Now, if we miss it, we we put it, we get it right. Okay, you understand that? But we don't get condemned over it. We realize Jesus paid the price for that missing it a long time ago. Praise God. Hallelujah. He did it in advance. He paid it forward. Praise God. It is pursuing the righteousness of faith that inspires confidence to receive. Let me repeat that. It is pursuing the righteousness of faith that inspires confidence to receive. Again, glory to God. Now, what's that? It's believing in what has been provided in our redemption through Calvary that inspires confidence to receive. Now, hold that thought, praise God. You know, we don't have a lot of time today, but I just want to, sh- I just, I just want to kind of wrap this up today. I want to talk more about this promise to be the heir of the world in the next episode. But uh, I, I want, w- want to get further into Romans chapter 4, and I also want to go back to Genesis 14, because we're going to find out some things that uh, have to do with how God dealt with our father of faith, Abraham himself. Praise the Lord. Because of what Jesus did for us and the fact that we are heirs of the world, that means we are getting ready to run all the systems of the world. And God wants to dispatch people into every realm of human activity, into the arts, into the media, into entertainment, into education, into government, into uh, business, into commerce, every for it, and by the way, into the ministry as well. But God wants to do that for each and every one of us. Before I uh, sign off today, I just want to mention this, that we are looking for some people to do some specialized coaching in divine healing. Those who follow this program know that I do a lot of teaching in the area of divine healing. And we want to identify people that are all in that are willing to pay the price to prepare themselves, praise the Lord, uh, for uh, being able to minister to the sick and have the confidence to know that whenever they lay hands on the sick, they're going to recover. And there's things that we must learn to adopt that mindset. So if you believe that you're one of those individuals, you can certainly uh, contact me through the website, ambassadorministries.org, and just find out if this is a good fit for you, and I'll be in touch. So praise God. I'm Brother Craig, and I just want to thank you for being a part of this broadcast. Let me just say to you once again that if you're born again, 
You are God's ambassador. You're his representative on the earth. Praise God. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us for The Ambassador with Craig Demo. To send your testimony or prayer request, visit ambassadorministries.org today. In the USA, write Ambassador Ministries, P.O. Box 19561, Portland, Oregon 97280. Again, the web address is ambassadorministries.org, where you'll find resources that will bless and enrich your daily life. This ministry is sustained by the faithfulness of God through our partners and friends. Find out more about partnering with the Lord through this exciting ministry by contacting Ambassador Ministries today. May God richly bless you in every way.